Kiss. Frog Prince Retold. A Tale in the Romance, a medieval fairy tale series. Written by Demelza Carlton. Auto narrated by AI Charlotte from Google. 1. If Philemon never felt the scorching desert sands beneath his feet again, he would be a happy man. How much further, he demanded. The camel driver turned and bowed apologetically. At least half the night, Your Highness. If you had not decreed a slower pace, we would be there already. Perhaps, but I would have left my blackened balls somewhere in the desert, for they would have bounced off at the pace this beast was going before. Philemon heard sniggering from behind him, but it was hard to discern one man from another, silhouetted against the setting sun and all. Ah, let them laugh. He'd served with the guardsmen until his father had died, forcing him to assume the throne. Philemon continued, There's little point taking one of the Sultan's daughters as my bride if I cannot consummate the marriage on our wedding night. If I cannot give the city an heir, you'll find yourself a new Prince of Tasnim, I am certain of it. The laughter was louder now, for they all knew as well as he did that he was the last of his father's line, and they'd need to look outside the city walls to find someone of sufficiently royal blood to take his place. Whether they liked Philemon or not, he was still their prince, a man of Tasnim. Which was why he gave the orders, not the camel driver. We must set up camp, rest for the night, and we will reach Tasnim on the morrow, Philemon finished. But there is no water, your highness, the camel driver protested. Philemon fought to keep his temper. Did the camel driver think he was blind? I can see that, he said with forced calm. Take us to the nearest oasis, and we will camp there. The camel driver spluttered. But, your highness, dot the nearest oasis was the one we left this morning. The only water for miles is in the wells of Tasnim itself, unless some magical wadi appears before us. Philemon laughed, but not for long. The man's idea of magic had merit. Philemon rubbed his ring, the one symbol of his sovereignty he carried with him everywhere. The jinn appeared, bowing low. What do you wish, master? Make me an oasis here, Philemon commanded. The jinn snorted with laughter. My master jests. The best I can make for you is a puddle, if I drink a good skin of wine and piss on that rock. He tugged at the loincloth he wore, as if he intended to do just that. I need water for my men and the camels to drink. Now, Philemon insisted. The jinn spread his arms wide. I have told you what I can do. Maybe you should have found yourself a different jinn, someone more powerful who can command water instead of stone. Fat lot of good he'd be when it comes to opening the gates of Tasnim, but he might be able to fetch you a drink. A different jinn. And Philemon had such a thing. Fetch the genie of the lamp. The one you found in the oasis outside the city gates, he said. I have a task for him. A servant appeared, bowed, then offered Philemon the dented, tarnished bronze lamp. Philemon rubbed his thumb across what appeared to be a scorch mark on the scored surface. Back and forth, back and forth, until blue smoke began to stream from the lamp spout. The enormous gin abased himself on the sand. How may I serve you, master? Make me an oasis right here, big enough to quench the thirst of every man and beast here twice over, and still have enough water for me to bathe, Philemon ordered. He waited for this gin to say the same words as the servant of the ring. Your wish is my command, master. It shall be done. And for that moment, Philemon knew he was the most powerful man in the desert. 2. Anahita knew the very moment she lost her sense of fear. One moment she was screaming, her broken arm splintering into a million needles of pain to the unholy delight of her new husband, and the next, the whole world went silent. He would beat her to death tonight, whether by accident or design, her dreamy mind told her. She should have been afraid, but death would be an improvement over the endless round of beatings that inevitably ended in rape. 
Her father had given her to this man in an attempt to bring peace, but Sheikh Fari did not understand the meaning of the word. He attacked her father's people to capture women to replace his dwindling number of wives, and he beat her every time her father's men fought back. The only way to end this was to stop him. The Sheikh cupped his hardening manhood and grinned. No. She would not submit to him tonight, or any other night. If she was going to die, she would do so without that final indignity. Anahita dragged herself to her feet. You're a coward, a man whose only courage comes from beating women. I hope when my father's men cut you down, they feed your body to pigs. Female pigs, she said. He shouted for his guards, and two enormous men rushed into the tent. Anahita knew them both, men the sheikh had assigned to watch her so that she did not run away. Hold her down so that I can cut out her lying tongue, he ordered, and the men moved toward her. Anahita had one chance. Don't touch my arm. It's broken, she implored, cradling it to her chest. Her husband might be a monster, but these two were merely men. The guards looked uncertain. A moment's hesitation was all she needed. She crumpled forward, righting herself just before she fell, feeling the leather hilt of her salvation in her good hand. She might die tonight, but she would not die alone. She lunged. The guard's blade pierced Fari's throat, and Anahita thrust it in deeper before ripping it out. Fari fell to his knees clutching his gaping throat, but the lifeblood sheeting down his chest told the tale's end for him as he gasped his last. When the light went out of his eyes, he pitched over sideways, his limp dick flopping onto the tent floor. He would violate no huris in the afterlife either, Anahita vowed, putting her borrowed blade to work again. She threw the pieces of hacked-off gristle onto a brazier, while blood leaked sluggishly from his groin. Only then did she turn to face the guards. Without fear, for if she died tonight, she died victorious. She held out the bloodied blade, but it slipped from her hand to land point down in the sand. Powerless. That's what she was now. That's all she had ever been. Do your worst, she said, falling to her knees. But she kept on falling into darkness that rose up to claim her. 3. The final stage of the journey home seemed to take hardly any time at all. Or perhaps that was because Philemon spent most of it wondering what he would call his new oasis. After all it was his, created at his command, so he should have the pleasure of naming it. His first thought was the most obvious name for the place, but calling it Lake Philemon wasn't enduring enough. Philemon was hardly a rare name even for a prince, and he wanted no confusion in anyone's mind that the oasis belonged to the Prince of Tasnim. But to call it Tasnim Oasis implied that it belonged to the whole city instead of its ruler. It was true that the wealth of water it contained would belong to the people of the city who traveled outside the city walls, for it was within his territory, but dot the lake of the people took away from the magic of making water appear in the desert. Well the jinn had performed the magic, but no one wanted the place named after a slave. Even if Philemon had known the slave's name, which of course he did not. There were far more important people for him to remember. Including Fadi, his vizier, who was waiting for him in his apartments when Philemon arrived back in Tasnim. Philemon sighed. He would have preferred his concubines to be waiting for him, but they would have to wait. The city came first, before Philemon's desires. I trust the city continued to prosper under your care? Philemon asked, beckoning for a servant to bring refreshments for himself and the vizier. Fadi bowed. I do my best, as always, your highness. The city has endured under your family's rule and enjoyed good fortune for many years as a result. But a strange thing happened this morning. He accepted a cup of wine and sipped from it. Philemon paused to savor the first taste of a particularly fine vintage before he replied, Ah, this is Tasnim. Did a cat chase a dog? Did my jeweled garden grow? Or did a bird fly out of a well? Fadi managed a smile but it did not reach his eyes. 
I fear it is nothing so small as a bird, your highness. Philemon felt the first twinge of unease in his belly. Then spit it out. Tell me what has befallen my city, so that I may set things to rights. It's the wells, my prince. Yesterday they were fine, but this morning, none of the buckets would reach the water. Then they need more rope. I am certain there is plenty in the storerooms. Have someone fetch it, and the wells will soon be set to rights. Perhaps the ladies of Tasnim have bathed more often of late, or this summer has been a thirstier season than most. Philemon forced himself to smile, even as a chill crept around his heart. Water was life, and the lifeblood of Tasnim. If something happened to their water supply. I already have, your highness. It took a dozen yards of rope, but we struck water again. Fadi swallowed, as if he hesitated to say more. Philemon knew his vizier, for the man had loyally served his father for longer than Philemon could remember. He waited in silence. Finally, Fadi continued, I set my clerks to search the records, looking for reports of this ever happening before. So far, they have found nothing. The waters of Tasnim have never dropped by so much. Ever. I fear magic or some sort of curse. Forgive me, my prince, but have you somehow angered someone powerful in your trip to the capital? Through some small act insignificant to you, arouse the enmity of some sorcerer? Philemon burst out laughing. Fadi, I visited the sultan for one purpose alone, to secure a wife from among his daughters. His matchmaker assured me that the sultan finds favor with my proposal, and will send an appropriate girl as soon as I send word we are ready for her. Unless some sorcerer has set his heart on the same girl the sultan intends to give me, chosen by the sultan, not me, for surely he knows his daughters best, I cannot imagine what offense I have given anyone. And if I have, dot why let them come? They may bring an army to Tasnim's gates, and we shall stand, as we always have, undefeated. Fadi returned his smile. Perhaps you are right, my prince. Maybe the earthquake we felt last night is the reason for it. It shook dust from the ceilings and spilled soup from my bowl but little else. Perhaps the water beneath the city spilled out of its vessel, too. That's the spirit. Tasnim will not fall while men like us rule her. Fadi left soon after, and Philemon headed to the garden, where his favorite concubines waited among the jeweled trees. The sound of soft music and feminine laughter lifted his spirits like nothing else. Yet later, when both he and his concubines were sated, he dismissed them back to the harem and lay alone in the darkness with his thoughts. Tasnim would not fall, he swore to himself. He was the prince of this city, and he would defend it to his dying breath. He padded out to where his bags had been brought in, and dug out the dented lamp. When the djinn appeared, Philemon didn't give him time to ask for orders. I command you to fill the wells of Tasnim to where they were before I left the city, he said. The djinn eyed him. You want me to bring the water back? Philemon swore. You stole the water from our wells? Then yes, I do want you to bring it back. Immediately. I hear and obey, the djinn said, and vanished. Satisfied, Philemon headed back to bed, and a peaceful night's sleep. It would be the last piece he would know for a long, long time. 4. Just leave her and let's go, a male voice hissed. Pain stabbed through Anahita's arm again, that's what had woken her, and she whimpered, her throat too hoarse to scream. She forced her eyes open, but the hulking shadow bending over her blocked the light. The only thing she could be certain of, was that he was the one hurting her. Stop, she croaked, batting at him with her good arm. When I have bandaged this properly or you will be crippled for the rest of your life, the man said. Anahita blinked and turned her head to get a better look at what he was doing. True to his word, he was bandaging her arm, which was already splintered so that it would heal straight. Take me home, where it will not matter. Servants will take care of me, she said. The men exchanged a glance. 
your home is probably destroyed like ours was, and every other village Fari attacked. Your home is gone. Haida, we have to go. Leave her. She will only slow us down. The second man glanced around nervously. They'll blame us for this. We cannot be here when the body is found. And where will we go? Our home is no more cousin. If we leave her, she will surely die, for Fari's men are no better than he is. I will not leave her to pay the price for justice for Nasreen. She deserves better. Take me home to the capital. Tell the Sultan about Fari. He must know, Anahita insisted. She grabbed the first man Hader's arm and heaved herself to her feet. Up she went, not and down again too, for her legs would not hold her. But she would not give up. She eyed the tent wall and the inch-wide gap between it and the sand. Fari's tent stood at the edge of camp, where fewer people would be disturbed by the screams of his women. For once this would work in her favor. She grabbed the jeweled cup Fari had swilled wine from and used it to shovel sand away from the tent wall. Soon enough, she dug a dent big enough for her to squirm through. If we go this way and keep to the shadows, we can reach the camels without anyone seeing us. Do you know where they keep supplies? We'll need food and water, it's a long journey. Well you heard the lady, the second man said. He threw himself into the shallow ditch Anahita had created, and after some widening of the pit, managed to leave the tent. Come cousin. Freedom awaits. Haidar eyed Anahita. What do they do to escaped slaves in your city, lady? Is it worse than what the desert people do to murderers? Anahita wet her lips. I do not know but, dot but, if you are the sultan's subjects, then surely he will free you for bringing word of what Fari did to your village. I swear I will do everything I can to see you freed, for you should never have been slaves in the first place. I will take a small chance of life over none at all. You first lady and I will follow after, Haidar said. Anahita nodded and followed Haidar's cousin. She hissed in pain as her broken ribs protested at bearing her weight, but she did not stop. She could not make it back home alone, and these men could help her. When she reached the cool night air, Anahita forced herself to her feet, ignoring the pain and the swirling in her head. If she showed weakness now, they would leave her behind. So she gritted her teeth and headed for the camels. A heavy hand landed on her shoulder, yanking her back. What are you doing? he hissed. Anahita glared at him. If we want to get out of here, we'll need a distraction to hold their attention. Releasing the camels to stampede through the camp should do it. Or a fire, Haidar said cheerfully, rubbing his hands together as he rose to his feet. A wisp of smoke curled up from the tunnel they'd crawled through. Fool! Hader's cousin growled. I'll get us some supplies. You get her to the camels. If she's not there when I get back, we go without her. He darted off. Shall we? Haida asked. Anahita nodded and led the way to the camels on the outskirts of the camp. She selected four who had been part of her entourage when she arrived, and led them away from the rest. Stay here with him, she told them, pointing at Haida. To him she said, these were my fathers. They will carry us home. Then she untied the rest. There is food hidden in the tents with the men, she said. Trample the tents and you will find it, but hurry. Heads lifted, and they stared at her uncertainly for a moment. Food. The men in the camp, the ones who beat you, they are hiding it, she said. Go and get it. A cloud of sand surrounded her as the grunting beasts rose to their full height, then lumbered off toward the camp to wreak havoc. Screams erupted. The screams of men, not women for once. Yes, she whispered, elated. What did you do? Haidar demanded. A shriek sliced through the sandstorm. A sound Anahita recognized. Vega. She ran toward her. Come back here, girl. 
Hader's hand reached for her, but Anahita dodged and ran on. She could not leave Vega here. But in the dark, the eagle's tethers were impossible to untie. Give me your knife, she said, holding out her hand. We need to go back to get Assad, Haidar said. I'm not leaving Vega. She is my hunting falcon, and she's coming home with me. Anahita glared at him. Give me your knife and help me cut the others free. They will help with the distraction. She felt the cold hilt in her hand and closed her fingers around it. The sharp blade sliced through Vega's jesses, and the bird rose into the air with a triumphant shriek. You may hunt in the morning. For now, stay with me, Anahita told the eagle, who settled obediently on her shoulder. She made quick work of the other bird's restraints too. The other birds eyed Vega warily, not budging from their perches for fear of what the eagle might do to them. Attack the men. They keep you prisoner. Once you are free you may hunt, and all your prey will belong to you, and no one else. I will keep you safe from this eagle, Anahita told the birds. Fly. The falcons rose, a mismatched flock with one deadly purpose. Vega clicked her beak in frustration, and Anahita reached up to stroke the eagle's feathers. You will fly free at dawn, I promise. But we must get far from here. She hurried back to the camels, where both men stood, waiting. What did you do? Haida asked. I've never seen animals obey like that. Anahita smiled. Magic. You're a witch. Hader's eyes showed white with fear. What's that bird for? Assad asked, pointing at the eagle. Vega is what you would call my familiar. My friend. Her only friend out here. She'd better not scare the camels, Assad said, climbing onto the lead animal. Anahita chose the smallest camel and struggled to climb onto her back. Between her broken arm and Vega, she was exhausted as she sank into the saddle. A drink for you, lady, for we will not have time to stop until we reach the next oasis, Haidar said, passing her a water skin. Anahita nodded her thanks, uncorked it, and drank. Wine coated her tongue, a welcome wetness as it trickled down her raw throat. Then she tasted the bitterness behind it, and it was too late. She tried to curse, but the words wouldn't come. The opium stole her wits and darkness engulfed her again. 5. Day after day, the water level dwindled, despite Philemon ordering the gin to refill the wells every night. One well ran dry, then another, and what had once been whispers became loud enough for even the prince to hear his citizens' concerns. Philemon summoned the gin door guardian. What do you know about the other jinn? he asked him. The jinn shrugged. He is the slave of a lamp, like I am the servant of your ring of office. He's powerful enough but I don't trust him. My treason has long since passed into legend but what is his crime? What did he do to deserve eternal enslavement? What if he is here to serve some other master, who wishes to bring Tasnim low? You're right. I don't trust him either. Every night I have ordered him to rectify our water woes, and every morning, they are worse. What does one do when a jinn is not following his master's orders? Philemon asked. The jinn shook his head. I have never heard of such a thing. It should not be possible. He must be in service to someone else who means you and the city ill. Someone whose orders are more powerful than your own. The only permitted reason for refusing an order is because a jinn lacks the power to do what he's asked. Otherwise I would fill the city's wells myself but you know I cannot. So what do you suggest? Philemon couldn't believe he was asking the jinn for help, but this jinn was once a vizier as loyal to the city as Fadi. And who knew jinn better than one of them? You can only fight magic with magic, and you need the help of someone more powerful than the lamp slave. I can let it be known among magical circles that you are looking for the help of a powerful enchantress, and you are willing to pay a high price for it. 
It was on the tip of Philemon's tongue to ask how high a price, but it didn't matter. The only price too high to pay was the loss of the city, and its water supply. If it cost him all the gold in the treasury, so be it. The city's wealth was in its water. Without it, dot the city would die. Do it. Find an enchantress powerful enough to save Tasnim from this djinn. While Philemon waited for the door guardian's return, he sent camel trains to the as yet unnamed oasis, to bring back water for the city. His concubines grumbled at having to surrender their bath to become the household water supply, but Philemon left them no choice. Once a place where water was plentiful, for the first time, Tasnim became like other desert cities, where every drop was precious. Finally, the door guardian returned. I have brought your enchantress master, the djinn announced. Allow me to present Lady Zuleika. She was his height, and she wore her hair uncovered, though it was twisted into a complicated knot on the back of her head, held in place by pins or magic, he wasn't sure. From her proud bearing she could have been a princess, not just a mere lady. The door djinn didn't seem to care about introducing him. Philemon sighed. If he wasn't enslaved to Philemon's ring of office, he would have sent the djinn away long ago. I am Prince Philemon, a humble prince in need of your help to control a troublesome djinn, Philemon said, bowing deeply. What sort of man sends a djinn to find an enchantress to solve his djinn problem? Lady Zuleika asked. It seems like a particularly sadistic task to set your poor slave. Philemon jerked up from his bow and met her amethyst gaze. He'd mistaken her for one of his own people, but her pale eyes and unnatural height marked her as the child of some northern barbarian from the lands where it snowed in winter. He'd heard tales that the northern women fought as warriors alongside their men, much like the women warriors who had once been garrisoned here, and her manners made him believe it. A pity, for the enchantress was young and pretty. She'd make a lovely wife where her tongue not so waspish. Those purple eyes blazed. Look at me like that again and I will leave, she snapped. Too late Philemon realized his lust had leaked out of his usually controlled expression. Or perhaps this witch had read his mind, he had heard tales of powerful enchantresses who could do such things. Philemon cleared his throat, trying to clear his mind of thoughts of this girl's body. This gin is not the problem. It's the other one. The slave of the lamp. He drained the wells of Tasnim dry and refuses to repair the damage he's done. Lady Zuleika nodded. Ah, no wonder the price you offer is so high. Gold is nothing compared to water in the desert. A gin who makes it disappear must be stopped. She waved a hand. Show me the gin who caused the trouble. Now? It would take his servants some time to make their way to the treasury in the lower levels of the city, to retrieve the lamp and bring it back. Time he did not want to spend in the enchantress's company, risking offending her again. Summoning the djinn will take time and you must be tired from your long journey here, Philemon said smoothly. Allow me to accommodate you in one of the finest guest chambers in the palace. Servants will bring you refreshments, water to wash with, and anything else you need. My other djinn will be your guide in the city, showing you anything you wish to see. She inclined her head. Thank you. I have heard great things about the generosity of desert hospitality, but this is the first time I have had the opportunity to experience it for myself. You'll have to wait until the water's back before you can use the bathhouse, the door djinn said. Philemon was struck with the irresistible image of the young enchantress in the harem bathhouse. Desire stirred, and more besides. I'll be in my chambers, he called after her and the door djinn. It wasn't a lie. He would be, after a detour to the harem to find a willing concubine or two to sate his desire. Because more than anything, Philemon knew he needed her magic more than he needed another girl in his bed.